Hey, it's uh, Benjamin Douglas Ray here with uh, Sustainable Cannabis TV. I'm here with John Schwartz today. How are you? I'm great, Ben. How you doing? Doing great today. You know, I really appreciate you coming on the show today, making the time for us here. John, John's a cannabis entrepreneur. He's been in the business for a really long time. He's traveled all over the world. He's lived in South America. Now he's here in L.A., and I'd love for you to tell the users kind of, you know, how you got to where you are today and your incredible journey uh, from from uh, what you were telling me about your South American stuff to to today. So we'll get into it. So welcome. Awesome. Well, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk here on your platform, doing great work. Tell you a little bit about my story and my background and where I came from and how I got to where I am today. Um, back in 2008, after <clears throat> the mortgage crisis, I was in Baltimore, Maryland. I was in the mortgage industry and I decided that, uh, it was no longer a good time for me to be in the U S that we were headed for a financial disaster. And I was going to take the opportunity to start to travel. I was actually married pri previously living in Maryland and working there. And I just decided to start traveling. So I booked a one-way flight to Mexico and started traveling south mm. um, with the intention of getting to Brazil eventually, maybe a six-month trip and maybe landing in Brazil and finding myself a piece of paradise on the beach somewhere. So you didn't really up. have a destination. You were just like, I'm going south. And I was just it. was going south. I bought a one-way ticket. Um, like I said, the intention was to get to Brazil, um, but I had no plans. I... I actually had to go to a friend's wedding in uh, Cancun, Mexico. And I walked out the front door of the resort when all my friends went to the airport and got on a plane to go home. And I just started walking to the bus stop and I, I went to Tulum, Mexico from there. And I just continued to travel. And I ended up going, uh, spent some time in Tulum, Mexico before it blew up. I headed down to Belize, into the Keys of Belize. Mm -hmm. um, I went into the jungle, saw some Mayan territory there. Um, I, I spent a bunch of time in, in Guatemala, um, I ended up in a place called Lago Atitlan in Guatemala, where I met my first business partner, um, first cannabis business partner, my first business partner, um, a guy named Daniel Hood. Uh, I met him at a kind of like a hostel type of place on the mm -hmm. lake. And I had these plans, like I had been talking to people during my travels and I, I eventually bought a plane ticket to Colombia, and I met him. I was like, yeah, I'm going to Colombia. He was really interested in that part of it. And he wanted to go too. So I ended up in Colombia. Um, I flew to Colombia from there and he ended up in Colombia as well a few weeks later. Um, from that point on, I, I just kept traveling through Colombia. About a month or two later, I met my current wife. Um, in Cartagena, Colombia, and I ended up staying for eight years. I got I got married. I had a kid. I opened many different businesses in the hospitality space. I owned the first place I opened was a bar and a restaurant on the Caribbean coast of of Colombia, just outside of a place called Santa Marta, Colombia. Um, I was there for about six months, and then I went to the interior of the country, and I built an eco resort slash boutique hostel backpackers resort. Cool. Um, we, uh, we started really small with about nine beds. We built it up to three different properties. We built, we developed a, a boot on, from ground up, another hostel, um, bar, restaurant. Um, and we, we had thousands, probably 10,000, over 10,000 guests over the years. Wow. We built it up pretty big. And I, but I had this opportunity with this guy who I met in Guatemala and he ended up also in Colombia. He spent time down there, um, learning how to make chocolate, um, spent time learning about dancing and salsa. And he presented this opportunity. He was traveling back and forth from California to Colombia the entire time. So back in 2009 until 2014, um, he'd end up going to like Humboldt County, doing trimming, working in the industry. Um, working on extractions and whatnot. And I was following it from the beginning, from 2009. I was really looking at the space, you know, being a cannabis consumer from back in, from the early 90s, um, always around the plant and sort of working in the industry, we could say. 
Um, so I was looking at the space a lot, but being in South America, I didn't have the opportunity, but because he was, he was in California working in the space, uh, he wanted to start an edible brand. So he started this company called Cali Gold, which are strain specific chocolates. Um, I was sort of the marketing and sales and business behind brain mentality. And he was the creative, he was the chocolatier at that point. Mm. Um, he was making the products and handling all operations. So we came together, we started that brand with a very small investment of, I think it was $30,000, bought some chocolate equipment, found the space to start making chocolates and started selling throughout California. We built the brand pretty quickly. We got over to about a million dollars in gross annual sales. In our second year in business, um, we, we were selling to over a hundred um, Proposition 215 dispensaries throughout California. Uh, we met, we won many awards for quality. Um, we were probably the second largest infused chocolate company in the Northern California. Um, but we didn't have enough cash to expand the business when, when California went legal in 2018, we started looking at it back from early, much earlier on 2015, 2016. And started figuring out how we were going to get licensing, how we were going to scale the business, how we were going to fund it. So we were looking for investors. I ended up moving to California, to Los Angeles in 2017 um, to focus 100% of my effort on Cali Gold, look for investors, build out the sales and marketing side of the business. Um, so we did what a lot of other companies were doing at that time, looking for investors and we were pitching. Uh, we went to an ArcView event, we pitched on stage, made lots of connections, ultimately found a deal with a Canadian outfit, public company um, in 2018. We didn't intend on selling it, we really just wanted to ra raise capital and run the business ourselves, but we had a great opportunity to get cash for the business and be able to, to operate it, to run the business and build and grow with a group that we thought were, had a good potential of being successful, but it didn't really work out. Like many of the stories you've probably heard before. Um, it was a company, somewhat of a holding company with invest, trying to invest in lots of different parts of the industry. And, uh, they made a lot of wrong decisions. I lasted with them for about two months or maybe a month when, I pretty much just was butting heads with almost everyone there. We had different beliefs and I moved on from that in late 2018. And I just started looking around at the space and seeing what, where the opportunities were being an entrepreneur for, you know, over for about 10 years or so, um, back in California, looking for some stability and a great opportunity. So kind of put my resume out there. I have a lot of sales experience. I, I found an opportunity with Boveda. Uh, Boveda is the two-way humidity control. In February of 2019, I started and I've been with them ever since. So I'm based here in, in Los Angeles. I have, uh, my territory is Southern California. Um, I represent Boveda here and I work with growers and brands and anyone who's you know, working with smokable, smokable flour, cannabis, hemp flour, anything. Yeah, it's a it's a good story. You know, it's like a lot of us, I think that you, you know, you do a lot of different things in the industry and, you know, look to get out, but you're kind of pulled back in and, you know, kind of floated around around for a long time. But that's a great, great story. And and uh, I'd like to hear more about, you know, your travels down there. But I do have some questions about uh, plastic containers, you know, and really a lot on this show, we talk about packaging waste and sustainability. And I'm interested, you know, really what your experiences were specifically with Cali Gold in terms of your packaging and really um, plastic waste and how you kind of address that and what you see as alternatives to that now going forward. Yeah, it's, uh, I think it's a huge problem. Um, <clears throat> you know, when I was in South America and I was, I owned this eco resort, I was focused on sustainability a lot and in my own property, in the, in the business that we ran and in my personal life. And as I moved into cannabis originally, it was, uh, when we first started on the proposition 215, it wasn't a huge problem because we weren't forced 
to use child resistant packaging and there was really no regulation. It was a gray market. Um, so we used foil and paper and it wasn't a huge waste and just like other packaged goods. Um, but then as legalization came on and we got closer to, two, to uh, 2018, started to see all the regulations, um, the laws that were needed for child resistant packaging. And it's, it's tough. Um, it's hard to figure out a good solution where you're not, I mean, CPG, consumer packaged goods, all, I mean, you're creating waste, you know, for the planet. And it's really hard to, uh, to figure out a good solution for that expense, especially when you're trying to figure out an affordable solution, because sure you can, you can find something probably that, um, is going to be better for the environment, but it's going to really significantly cut into your margins and make it more difficult. So, one of the things that I noticed um, when, as we were getting ready to launch, and we sold the business in 2018, so I didn't spend that much time in it. But one of the major problems I saw were like there were so many regulations coming down in California with the exit bags. The exit bags had to be they were in mylar bags they were using, and they were childproof. So I, basically, every single time you went to a dispensary here in California, you were buying this huge mylar bag, you know, with a child lock on top, and all this other packaging and it's just, it's so, there's so much waste. So, I mean, now there's lots of hemp plastics, I think is a good solution, but I know it's more expensive. Um, but uh, I think what it comes down to is all the companies, all the brands being forced to fit within the, within the regula regulations and follow, you know, child safety rules and all that stuff. So, major problem i mean we're, we're we are adding a lot of waste for sure to the planet um but especially compared to the way it was before talking about no, it is a big problem and that's one one thing that we talk a lot about here i've been talking about it for the past few years really you know how to reduce waste and obviously with the labeling requirements you know you need bigger packaging cr does add some complexity to it and i really maintain that until we're truly and if we can be truly disruptive, that means we have to cut the prices in half. Uh, you know, something that's sustainable and say child resistant has to be half the price, really, if it's going to change. Because until then, you know, consumers aren't going to pay more. The brands say like, well, it does cost more. We're going to pass that on to consumers, but consumers aren't going to pay more. They're not going to pay 10% more, 20% more. They're going to pay less. So what I keep talking about here, and we, we, I'm, I'm really trying to call out to companies to be innovative in their thinking in terms of their materials is, how do you make something that applies to all the regulations? Because I don't think the regulations are gonna change anytime soon. I mean, maybe for flour, eventually you may not need CR, but, uh, but right now everywhere you definitely need child resistive packaging, which I think is a good thing in general, but I think that for it truly to be disruptive, to be sustainable and CR, it's gotta be less expensive. And the companies need to really think hard about how do we cut costs? And that doesn't just mean in the package itself, that means all the way from the life cycle. So where it's made, how it's distributed, how it's recycled or what it's done away with at the end, because it is a big problem. But this industry is really young. I mean, compared to a lot of industries, it's young. The, the legal market's really young. So we have an opportunity to truly be innovative here and and get our heads together all the way down the supply chain and really come up with some solutions here. So we've got a comment here uh, from Nisha, which is applicable here. Why does the industry have such a hard time working together to garner buying power to bring the prices down for more sustainable packaging? You know, um, uh, John, go ahead and, and address this from your opinion. And then I've got an opinion on it too. Yeah, I think it's hard for an industry where everyone's somewhat in competition to work together. Um, I mean, maybe nobody's in competition. It would be somewhat idealistic to think that everyone can get together and just solve the problem. Um, but uh, that's that would be that's that's the I think that's the right way to think is how can we work together to find the solution because. It is, that's really what it comes down to is you're talking about really many small companies, um, some big companies, some medium sized companies, but a lot of different operators with the same problem. So try to bring them together. I think it's a great solution. 
I think I think that that is a solution, and it's also the biggest challenge because a lot of people, as I've said many times, you know, they hold their cards close to their vests, you know, and you don't want to share secrets, you don't want to cooperate, you know, and it is a lot of little people, a lot, and the the hardest thing about that is if you're a small operator, you have small MOQs, so the price is going to be more. So if there were a way to, you know, truly work with other companies to focus on, you know, uh, the same, let's say, packaging all the way down the line, you would be able to do that, that purchasing power here. Got a, another question here uh, from, from Dustin or a comment. We need to work together to develop a solution as a downstream infrastructure doesn't exist for the end of life. Yep, and uh, that's, that's true. Thanks, Dustin. Uh, Nisha Dustin. here, thanks again. Um, or, oh, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, that that uh, that clicked off there, Mark uh, Nish Kaplan. Cooperative groups uh, buys are common in the nonprofit. So, you know, if you have some examples there, Mark, that you could post, that would be great uh, that we could use as examples. But I think that those co-ops would certainly be a way to go. I, I think all these ideas are great and they're very much needed as long as people would talk together, you know, with one another. So, well, thanks. Let's move on to the next question here. You know, we've talked about indoor and outdoor grows, and I know from being in Colorado that a lot of people had outdoor grows. And when we went rec here, a lot of the uh, warehouses were, you know, kind of snapped up by a lot of people. They moved their grows indoors. Uh, but then we found out that these 100-year-old buildings have pesticides up in the rafters or things from the bricks. So it's like, okay, now moving to greenhouses, but now the greenhouses have lights to let the light in. And pesticides are flowing out in the outdoors as well. So what what really are the challenges between the two? And what do you see coming out of this as which one's going to win overall, outdoor or indoor? So first of all, I'm not a grower and I'm not going to pretend to be uh, a growing professional. I'm only offering my opinion and I, I don't judge any indoor growers, but my personal belief is that if we can use the power of the sun and put the plants in the ground into the soil, um, and regenerate the soil and, and work with Mother Nature as opposed to against it, then we're better off. I mean, I know that the energy and the amount of energy we're using to power an indoor grow is really high. Um, maybe I know that there's some, some companies that have built um, solar powered or at least they're somewhat powered by the sun indoor facilities. So, you know, as a consumer, I like indoor cannabis. Um, I like the fact that it, it looks really nice and then we can get really firm nugs and um, you can really get high THC, but I also really appreciate sun-grown cannabis. So wherever it's possible in California, I mean, we have great climates for growing and there's, a, there's an opportunity to get a lot of it outdoors. Um, but in other markets, I mean, this is just, it's a segmented market across the country and then throughout the world. I mean, every little pocket is going to be different. And I am sh I have no, no idea what it's like to grow in Michigan, but it's probably easier to grow it indoors, I would assume. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, those, those are challenges. Wherever you are, you're going to have issues. I mean, without outside, you've got, you know, water. You know, where's the water come from? Is the water going to be tainted? You've got uh, pollutants flying through the air. Are those going to get an outdoor, you know, you have bugs, you have all these things. So there's certainly a trade-off. We've seen it here go more toward indoor with, you know, kind of uh, light. So you get a little bit of both uh, in those. Yeah, I know that if you're like looking at like a pharma model or something like that and you want more consistency, it's probably a lot easier to do it indoors. Yeah, yeah. I but mean, since the conversation is sustainability and like let's figure out a way to use the sun as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah, there's got to be a way, you know, going forward. Like I said, this industry is so young and a lot of a lot of people are kind of, you know, in this industry are really, you know, truly maverick entrepreneurs and trying new things and kind of seeing what works, yet juggling with the, the regulatory bodies all at the same time. So as things start to to evolve, I think we're going to start to see a lot of innovation. And and because of COVID, I'm seeing a lot more innovation happening. In fact, the, the call that we had yesterday uh, we were talking a little bit about IA and how how that can work, automation can work with farming, you know, and that certainly applies to cannabis as well. So, well, what about hemp? 
you know, we talked a little bit about that, about industrial hemp. You, you and I were talking this morning about that. And what do you what do you see going forward for the uses and the kind of applications and the prospect for hemp, not only in packaging, but but anything else you know, industrial wise? Oh, well, I think that hemp could save the world, honestly, without also, I'm not an expert and I'm not going to talk like a scientist because I'm not one. Um, but I've talked to many people and looking at all of the things that hemp could be used for. I mean, first of all, why wouldn't we make all of our paper out of hemp? You know, we can make all of our, uh, a lot of our clothing out of hemp. Um, we can make hempcrete. We can build houses with hemp. Um, we can make plastic out of hemp. I've seen so many uses for what we can make out of it. I have somebody who I was talking to in Colorado developing, um, roofing roof roofing out of hemp mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we're not talking about something that's significantly more expensive we're talking about in line with the current materials that they're using now um so I, when i say that it could save the world i don't really just mean that we can change we can we can make new products out of hemp and it will save the world i mean but if you look at the science and what it actually does how it's how it's cleaning out the soil when you grow it and how it's sequestering carbon out of the air we're helping our climate to improve our climate. So I think that's what, the main reason why industrial hemp specifically, I mean, also hemp that they're using for CBD as well, but even better when it's industrial hemp because it's grown closer together. Um, it's even better for the environment and let's do as much of it as possible. I know that we're not really set up for it in the US and it's, it's like an emerging, you know, after the farm bill and everything, like so many people have invested into it. Like if you looked at how many people got into hemp and how it all worked out, I mean, the conversation we've probably had this conversation so many different times so many people went into it and people started growing genetics growing seeds and then people were growing flour we were growing biomass now biomass isn't worth anything anymore people are growing smokable hemp people are growing industrial hemp and when it comes to industrial hemp it needs to be massive thousands and thousands of acres so um we don't have the infrastructure yet i know that there's a lot of people who are working on it now and building the equipment that's needed to to process all of the industrial hemp and actually make something out of it. But I know that there's buyers for the finished product, um, but just don't have the infrastructure set up yet. So I'm very, very long on hemp and what it can do for our environment. How can it you know, improve our soil and our air? You know, talking about Columbia, um, I was working on a project uh, about a year and a half ago and it was a it was a hemp project, a CBD project, and and it was either Cartagena or Bogota. Really, was setting itself up to be kind of the center for hemp production for CBD production in all of South America. And you know, then COVID kind of came, so I don't know kind of what happened with that. But I know that they're really trying to be the hub. And now, especially with Mexico coming online, I think that there are big plans there. Did you see any of that coming when you were down there? Absolutely. You see that. I mean, the thing about Columbia is you have 12 hours of sunshine all year long um, and you have really good soil, a lot of volcanic soil, and you have a population of farmers. There's a lot of farming communities and they're used to um, farming fruits and vegetables and flowers and, and more than that and exporting throughout the world. So they kind of they have the infrastructure set up. The prices of CBD, isolate, distillate, all of the above dropped so drastically in the last 12 to, I guess, just over 12 months or so that it's, I'm, I'm sure that it's been hard for me. I have a few friends with licenses down there and they're competing with, uh, with growers in the U.S. And it, it's not easy, of course, but um, we'll see. I think for the long run, once everything settles down, they'll be in a good position. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. You know, I'm looking forward to seeing how, you know, all once all of North America kind of comes together, well, actually, Canada and Mexico are going to kind of cut us out, I think, of the legal uh, THC market. But, you know, I think it's a start to have all of us kind of as a block. And as the world starts to get more educated, really, on the merits, the medicinal efforts, not only of CBD, but also of, of THC for therapeutic you know, benefits, it's going to start to benefit all of us. And we'll see more cooperation, hopefully, you know, more cooperation, not only through countries, but through states as impacts here in the United States. And also, as we were talking about with next door neighbors in Los Angeles, uh, getting together to do 
cooperation on buying, you know, some buying power. So looking yeah. forward to that over the next however long. I mean, it's only going to go up over the next 10, 20 years. You know, it's not going back. We know that. So, yeah. well, thanks for your time. I, uh, I wanted to ask you, what are your predictions uh, ending up here for this year for the cannabis market and what's going to happen here over the next 12 months? <clears throat> well, um, interesting. When I talk about I, when I talk about cannabis and like the markets and my predictions, I'm, I am very long on cannabis. And, you know, we've been through this whole thing where the whole raising money thing and these inflated valuations and that whole financial play have kind of gone through this whole bubble and then burst. And now we're like really ready to climb where we're in like the second wave where we're approaching the third. Hey, uh, can can you hear me now? I think we just, I just lost you. I lost your, uh, I lost you. So, uh, sorry everyone, don't know if you can hear us. We'll, uh, thanks for the show, apologize. Thank you. <laughs>